gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the crowd, But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet when wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such is your glorious will. All things have been handed over to me by your father, by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and will learn from me. For I am gentle and, my, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to the Lord Christ. Christ. come to you in the name of the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. also come to you as a friend. I have no illusions that anybody is standing out there, so here we go. Don't worry about being seen. <laughs> you know, the gospel for this week is a theologically dense, and it's a telling tract. And it's, the gospel is also one of the most revealing gospel tracts when it comes to describing our relationship with God. You know, when we listen back to the words that Steve said from the Gospel of Matthew, I think it's safe to say that Jesus gets it when he describes how the world reacts to the message of God. Because if we're honest, it's a little hard for us to digest the Word of God. Look at the words of Jesus. I think they're theologically dense, so I don't mean to duplicate services, but we'll go through them a little bit more here. Jesus said to the crowd, to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. This is not one of those, oh, look at the little children statements. This means you're acting like children, like kids, right? He said, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. In other words, they put it out there and nobody reacted. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. More about that in a few minutes. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. I'll see here, being a child is a good thing. Yes, Father, so is your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal. And then the very famous words, which Steve spoke so eloquently about in the New Day Prayer on Wednesday. It says, Come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The funny thing about that, though, is it's amazing. I think that we're all this uh, trip the tongue with that because we're thinking about King James Version of this, which kind of comes readily off of our tongues. But it's easy to say that this is theologically dense. 
In this section of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is telling his followers that folks basically don't get it. He's relating the fact that the wisdom of God has seemed to elude the folks he's trying to bring to his yoke. The reading begins by Jesus recalling the reaction to John the Baptist. Jesus tells us that people thought he was possessed by demons. And if we're honest, we have to ask, how can we blame the generation that condemned John the Baptist? I want you to think about that guy. A guy in seminary we lovingly called j right? He wore rags. He ate bugs. He raved about the coming destruction and was not very nice about the point of, when he pointed out failures of those around him. I'm going to dare you to think about this. If you had a minister who showed up to church on Sunday dressed in skins and rags in this day and age, eating a bug sandwich, screaming about the end of the world, I think our new bishop might get a few phone calls. Jesus' point for pointing towards John the Baptist is that John's ministry was not one that people expected or probably thought was appropriate. When you get down to it, they killed him for it. If we're brutally honest, it's not a ministry that we would probably want or accept in our churches or our communities. I think about my times of living back in Manhattan where people would be on soapboxes and doing the same thing. You walk wide and far around this place. Jesus, in the next part of the passage, turns to describing his ministry. Jesus points to the fact that instead of being super conservative in doctrine like John, he seemed to do things on, on the other end of the spectrum, and that made people uncomfortable. He ate with sinners, healed anyone that wanted to be healed. He did not ask for the card from the synagogue before he did it. He consorted with prostitutes and shared a table and drink with those who others thought undeserving and unclean. In other words, Jesus talked up and demonstrated a radical welcome that made folks uncomfortable. People in churches all over the place have that uncomfortable feeling when somebody walks in who doesn't look like they do. Jesus was talking about the radical welcome that makes people uncomfortable. And even though this is a message of Jesus, phone calls have been made to church hierarchies complaining about this sort of ministry in parishes around the world. I remember one parish in which the homeless were to be housed on a sub-freezing night. Sadly, this ministry, which is the very epitome of the gospel, was questioned and complained about by a few parishioners because giving, the shelter, giving shelter to the cold would ruin the carpets. In fact, they asked, hey, are we going to wash the carpets after they leave? And the deacon, being a deacon, said, no, we're going to wash them before they come. Jesus tells about us about this dichotomy in reactions because it was a reaction that God received when the flock were confronted by the nature of God. Say that again. Jesus tells us about this dichotomy in reactions this to this, because it was a reaction that God received when the flock were confronted with the true nature of God. This passage speaks to us because we can still encounter the same reaction. Jesus then tells us why the revelation of God is so often rejected. Jesus tells us that the reason of the rejection is simply because, guess what folks, we think too much. We try to figure God out. This is not to say that we are to blindly follow along with anyone, anything someone tells us God told them. You know, God gave us brains for a reason. We talked about that. What Jesus is telling us is that we try to intellectualize the gospel or the revelation of God and make judgments according to our misguided, very human reasonings and expectations. Guess what? We always fall. And this is hard for us. Because we always want to be seen as striving for something. We have that Protestant work ethic. They know nothing about that in South Dakota, work ethic, right? Get 
getting somebody to sit down in South Dakota is one of the hardest things I've ever seen anybody try to do. We always want to be doing something, striving for something. Because we got to work for it, right? When a beautiful piece of music is made, it comes from long, hard work and dedication. When beautiful buildings or fences are constructed, they're a product of work which is creative, intellectual, and physical. you got to figure things out. It's something that speaks to our nation as a whole right now and the whole world. Vaccines come from tireless hours of dedication, scientific reasoning, and experimentation. So obviously we're going to ask the question, why should God's revelation be any different? Should we reason out God's will for us by sheer will of the mind, putting God into terms that we can understand and predict? No. This is not what Jesus tells us of the revelation of God. Jesus tells us that we are to come to God with the trust of a child. Everything that we think we know about God is tempered by our own hubris, comfort, and expectations of stability. Jesus tells us that these indoctrinated dialogues are nothing but the product of our imagination and that God is greater than anything we can comprehend. We're to come to God with our defenses down, the trust of a child. I do want to give it to you in words you can understand a little bit. Think of how much you might love your parents or your child or your spouse. Think of the ferocity of that love. Now think of the love of God and try to comprehend how much more that would be. You can't do it. We're not equipped. All of this is not to say we're only to be only as innocent as doves because we must be discerning and latch onto the wisdom given to us from God. After all, God gave us brains for a reason. But if we think in the scope of love, this sometimes means we have to reject the wisdom of this broken world to embrace the call of God. And sometimes it just doesn't make sense to us. But we're to follow the love, the radical welcome of God. And as John said, repent when you're doing it wrong and come to God. Now, if this sounds difficult, I'm going to tell you one thing. It is. Stuff's not easy at all. Because this world pulls us in so many ways. We were talking the other day how we were bombarded with information. Cell phones hang above your head like the sword of Damocles. They never go away. News feeds, social media, memes. Now, some of these things are good and some are not so good. Anybody's ever had to use a cell phone to call 911 in the middle of nowhere? It's a pretty good thing. But if they keep you on a razor's edge, they're not. We're bombarded by information. How do we figure out where God is in all of this information? This information and confusion and all of its usefulness can also seem to burden our mental health and make our souls heavy laden with stress and worries that manifest itself as anger and vitriol. This is why Jesus calls us to put down the burdens and follow him. Put away the burden of thinking that you've got God figured out. The self-inflicted burden that tells you, tells us all that Jesus relies on you and me to exist. Jesus asks you to put away the burden of the illusion that tells you that you're in control. Jesus tells you to put away the burden of distrust and anger. And pick up the easy and loving yoke of love, faith, hope, and trust. God has designed a yoke, as Steve told us, that is easy. And it's a burden that makes the world so much more beautiful and full of love. 